the ones we can get, get them in. But what's up, everybody? Two days left. Full Uni Friday tomorrow. Unfortunately, last Full Uni Friday. But just for tomorrow, if you – we don't have any more hats left. I'm all out of hats. <laughs> so if you win, you're getting a shirt because I have shirts, either white or black. So whoever the winner is tomorrow, let me know your which color you'd rather have white or black and I'll send one of those out to you guys too but thanks for just showing up every day I mean this has been a core group right here i um, the ones that are still in here and you guys are getting a lot out of this which is really cool um one sec let me close off the chat real quick but it's been really cool to see that and now just getting into the strength stuff just reiterating how important this stuff is from Sam and Ronnie and just from the other guys being able to give their insights on it. it's very very important and seeing it this morning again today with some of the pitchers in here in Arizona just doing a bunch of like band jumps doing some medicine ball work it was really cool to see and a lot of them have had these big jumps in their velocity and mind you they're all in high school but it's never too young to start some of this stuff it doesn't mean you're getting under a bar and doing a thousand pounds it just means we're getting used to moving our bodies athletically and I think that's what it's all about um, just a quick reminder we will be continuing baseball school so if you guys are interested or have people that are interested we're going to start next week fellas you think next week good yeah it's probably Probably yeah. next Monday evening. We'll send a reminder on email. So tell your parents to look out for an email by tomorrow night at the latest. But we will send an email out with that. We're going to continue that at least once a week. And um, we'd love your feedback too. So when we send out the email, if you can give us some feedback, you, your parents, whoever it is, um, of things that you want to continue to learn, some things that you've learned during this, some things that have been helpful, uh, maybe something that uh, you want to just add in to the crew, whatever it is feel free to add that in there too. But I just wanted to make sure that we know that this will be continuing and we will keep it going throughout the summer because it's been fun. We've been loving it. So keep up the good work. Keep up the good attitudes. This has been awesome. Ronnie, Sam, do your thing. I'm excited to listen in and uh, watch you guys crush it again. Absolutely. Um, I don't think that we're going to do any type of screen share. If we want to shut that off, we're good. Yeah, I just shut um, it off. So guys, we're going through speed and agility, strength, uh, speed and agility training, working on getting faster. Um, I really think that this is a piece of the game where, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, like speed is actually probably the best, like one of the better tools in the game. Um, it creates so much havoc on the base pass. And I know we talked about base running last week, but I know that as we get into speed, it kind of correlates where we talk a lot about, um, you know, getting faster and how to get faster and how to move your body better. But it also applies to how can we actually have that work on the field. So when we talk about increasing speed, that's going to be more of your like outfielders, your straight line sprints. Um, home to first, home to second, things like that. And then when we talk about the agility stuff, that's going to be your lateral movement, which is kind of your first move, like your first step on going after a ground ball or taking that good first step on attacking a fly ball. Um, or if you're a third base or first baseman, kind of getting your body prepped to be able to move and go attack the baseball. And I think this is all with reaction and things like that. So, Sam, when we talk about speed and we're talking about quickness within speed. Speed's obviously trained, and we talked about that the other day. Some guys are naturally more fast, like naturally faster than others. But, you know, how can you train speed? Like we talked about, I think you should be doing sprints four days a week. But what are some things that these guys can be doing in their sprint work? that can help them get faster? And, and what are, what's your recommendation? Should we do shorter sprints, longer sprints? You know, how would you kind of go about all of that stuff when it comes to straight sprint stuff? So the first piece of it is going to be, obviously we're, we're quarantined guys. I know, you know, over here in New York, we're probably a little more quarantined and more limited than a lot of other guys, but sprinting is by far the number one thing you guys can do right now. It's going to, honestly, it's going to keep a lot of your strength gains because you're still operating at such a high speed. So sprinting to me is the absolute biggest thing that a lot of you guys can do right now. You know, it's almost impossible to get equipment if your parents are trying right now. Like sprinting is, is that's it, man. That's what you can do. Like if there's anything easier, you can just go outside and freaking sprint. So there's really no excuse for it. it. Should be honestly, I'd say especially right now, but usually for most athletes, we're looking at two to four days a week. Uh, two days is kind of the minimum, even in season. Like we really don't want to stop sprinting ever. You know, it's such a fast movement and, Every quality that you train, so if you're looking at, let's say, aerobic training, so like, you know, slow, steady runs, you got strength training, you have power work, and each effect is going to last for a different amount of time. So let's say I was training all those qualities and I stopped on May 1st. Speed's only going to last the same for about five to seven days. It's not going to be a crazy decrease, but you'll see a couple, you know, a couple percentage. And if you try to get in that mindset of getting 1% better each day, which I know you guys have talked about things like that earlier in, you know, in baseball school, you don't want to see something go down. There's no reason for it, especially when it's so easy to just go out and sprint. So 
that's the first thing. I, so two to four times a week is good. And then as far as duration goes, the most important piece of sprinting is not getting tired. You can't get fatigued. If you get fatigued, your sprinting speed will go down. Your mechanics will go out the window. And all of a sudden, you're not training speed. You're just training to get tired. So you guys got to think about, you know, what do you want your body to learn? Because your body's going to learn from whatever stimulus, like whatever you throw at it, your body's going to say, oh, man, I, I need to get better at this because I'm doing it all the time. So I have to adapt. But if you only teach it to get tired, then it goes, oh, maybe I should just work on getting less tired. And that, that's, a, that's a different quality that's important, but that's not speed. So if you guys are training speed, just recognize, you know, it should be shorter sprints. If you're sprinting over 10 seconds, I'd say it's not even a sprint anymore. You know, if you look at a 60-yard dash, you know, for our high school guys or college guys, you're looking at six to seven, maybe maybe eight seconds if you're running pretty, pretty slow there. Um, so overall, you know, it shouldn't last more than that. And most of your sprints are going to last only four or five seconds. If you're working at top speed, you guys cannot hold top speed for more than about four to five seconds. You will decrease. So we, don't, we never want to train to the point where you start to decrease. And then when you guys sprint, if you guys sprint, say, 30 yards, you're looking at like a minute and a half to three minutes rest. I know it's a lot more time than you guys are used to. Like a lot of you guys probably sprint and then pretty much just, you know, sprint again and pretty much just sprint again and never take rest. Take a minute and a half, take three minutes, take four minutes, take five minutes. You're going to find that your power output is way more consistent. You're actually working at hundred percent more often. So I'd rather see you do five really, really high quality reps at hundred percent than I would 10 reps with two of them being at hundred percent. It doesn't make sense. We're getting five good ones or two bad or two good ones. You know, so just keep that in mind. I think the most important piece and the biggest piece that I see missing for guys is just getting too tired. Fatigue is going to mask performance. You can't let that happen. And hydrate too. Like when you're taking your break, that's a good time to drink some water. Sure. I know, I know like for a lot of you guys, like when you guys go to work out, you think that your body has to keep moving through your whole entire workout. But if you think about like a max lift, so for the high school guys who are doing any type of, you know, one or three rep max lifts, you are going to take a big break in between that lift because you want to make sure that your body is able to recover. It's the same thing with a sprint. Think about baseball, guys. If you really think about the game of baseball, you're going to go from, you know, let's say home to first base and four seconds, boom, we're down to first base. Now there's a break. There's a break where, you know, the other batter has to go up to the batter's box. The pitcher has to kind of get set. You know, everybody's got to kind of get back into position after the play is over. You're giving yourself enough time to take that rest anyway before you take your lead or whatever you're doing. So you guys can actually that's, – that's kind of replicating the same type of game speed. Um, now, Sam, when they are going through their sprint work, like at least for baseball, we do a lot of 60-yard dash stuff. There's a lot of opinions on the 60-yard dash on whether it's valuable or not. I don't think that that measures somebody's home to second speed, realistically, because in baseball we don't run in a straight line – you know, from home to second, we're actually making turns and things like that. But when they're doing sprint work, like what's the, what do you think the most beneficial thing is? Do you think it's a 10 or a 20 yard burst? Do you think it's 40 to 60 yard burst? Or do you think it's like 80 to hundred yard burst? Like when I used to do my sprint training, I would do like, I was really slow out of the box. It seemed like at least initially. So I would do more 10 yard burst stuff. And then I would get into like the 25 or the 30 or the 40. I'd run a couple sixties and then I would end with like a hundred you know, just to kind of let myself kind of sprint out and do it. But I was giving myself a good enough amount of break that I was able to do that. So I know that strength goes into a lot of speed and agility training. Like I know that strength is a big piece of that hamstring strength, quad strength, actually getting the hips to kind of go fast and move quick. I, I know that that's big plus flexibility too, because you got to be able to extend out and stride out. Right. And we can talk about that a lot more, but you know, do you recommend doing more 10 yard, 20 yard bursts? Do you think long distance sprints are good or, or would you keep it to time? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a multifactorial question. So if I'm training somebody, it really comes down to what they're doing too throughout the week. Right. So if they're only going to sprint twice a week, uh, we're probably going to do a lot of work and like that. I, I go by time, especially since we got a lot of younger guys on here, if you go by time, it's going to be easier. And again, you're, you're not going to be able to maintain a max speed for more than like five seconds, usually not much more than that, at least. Um, so we don't need to push that envelope. So for most guys, we're looking at like a four to six second sprint is usually a pretty good window. That being said, if you're looking at, you're training it often. Like let's say you have two days where you're going to go in and you are going to train sprinting, but you're like, I know I have a guy on here, for instance, who needs to work on the same thing you were talking about. He needs to work on that acceleration. He's very, he's not slow, I would say, once he gets going, but getting going takes some time. So we're going to have two days maybe dedicated towards like legit sprint work. We're going to spend some time on it. 
in his warmups on the other day, we're probably going to finish with like those 10 yard, you know, accelerations and things like that. Um, because they're not going to be as demanding on your body and you're going to be able to get that frequency up. The more you guys train this stuff, the better it's going to be as long as you're not fatiguing yourself. Like as long as you can recover from it, it's going to be only better to train it a little bit more. Just, you know, picking what you need to train. Like if you guys are younger, you know, sprinting is important. I would definitely do it at least two times a week. But again, you know, just getting a baseline of strength is important. Uh, a baseline of just movement quality, like understanding how your body moves is really important. So it kind of changes depending on the person, but I'd say for most people getting a mix of, you know, five second sprints and their six second sprints. And then just like those 10 yard, you know, 20 yard accelerations, because those are easy to just throw into a warm up. Right. And then I know for a lot of guys, like, I mean, we can get into like a skips and all that stuff and what we used to do. I know that that's a little bit, I mean, we can get into all that stuff at some point, but realistically when guys are running, I see a lot of people with some heavy feet right? Like very heavy, like kind of slam their foot in the ground. How do we pick up that speed and what part of the foot should we really be running on? Um, I know this is probably an easy one, even for the younger guys to kind of work through. I, I know that's why I wanted to ask that question, but when we're talking about running with these guys, I think that run quality, I think is huge too, on actually being able to run properly and run the right way. So what are some exercises they can do to actually move through a good running form? And then what part of the bot, like what part of the feet should we be you know, running with? Um, where should our legs be working? Like, do we want to have our body angled over top? Like, how do we actually work through like good running form? So uh, I'll say two real easy things. The first one, and I remember reading a quote from, I think it was an Olympic sprint coach. And he would always say that when his athletes weren't sprinting correct, when they were sprinting wrong, their quads would be sore. That's when they were doing it wrong. And if they're doing it right, they're always going to feel their hamstrings. They're going to feel glute involvement. Basically like the back of the leg for you guys that might not know the muscles. But when your front of the leg is sore, you're probably not running correctly. Um, and that, that's going to be something you want to address. Now, the second analogy I like to use, I don't remember who I got this from, but if you guys ever turned a bike upside down and you got the wheel, you know, where it's just free, if you guys try to spin the wheel, the first couple ones, you have to like pull, you have to get it moving and that's acceleration. So you really have to put some force into it. That's going to get the ball rolling. That's going to get the wheel spinning. After that, you have to be able to move very quickly. And that's the main thing. So you can look at, you know, they use the, the idea of ground contact time. So how long does your foot stay on the ground? So basically, if my right foot hits the ground, I want to be able to basically get it off the ground as quick as possible and keep my momentum going forward. So a lot of these guys are really trying to push once they get going, and you shouldn't. Like once you get going, those sprints need to be about keeping moving. So if I'm on that bike again, right, the first ones, I'm grabbing the wheel, I'm pulling hard. Once it gets going, I'm barely hitting it. I'm just skimming the surface and just keeping sliding and keeping going and just going fast. And that's pretty much what sprinting is. Like once you get going, it's more so about how fast you can move your legs rather than how hard you're going to push into the ground. And you shouldn't be pushing into the ground that hard. And then uh, the second thing, which I think is really interesting, and this is something that's picking up a lot of information lately. So they talk about rate of force development, which is basically like how quick can you produce force? So, for instance, if you tie lifting in with this, I can always tell you, if I have a guy who comes in day one and we do an assessment, and because we're limited on space, we, we don't have you know, space to test like a 30-yard dash or something like that, we do a long jump. And every single time I have an athlete come in who crushes the long jump, you know, maybe has like the record in the gym for it, even if they've never lifted before, their deadlift, once they learn technique, is always going to be strong just because they know how to use the back of their legs. They always have that, that fast twitch muscle. They understand how to produce strength and power quickly. So there's like, there's a relationship between if you guys train sprinting, you actually can get stronger. So for you younger guys too, if you guys work on sprinting, you might actually come into the weight room. And when you eventually get in there, you might already be stronger. So we might not have to worry about that type of stuff as much. I, I don't need an athlete to deadlift 500 pounds. Like to me that, you know, maybe once in a while, but there's really no point. Right. We're not going to do that on the field. Everything on the field is quick. So I think for most athletes, you know, the biggest things you want to keep in mind is when you accelerate, your first bet needs to be getting motion that way. It's got to go sideways. And too many guys go straight upright. And when you go upright, all of your force is going straight downward, going straight into the ground. And that's only going to push you up and down. It's not going to repel you forward. So basically what they're talking about now, and they're studying this, the athletes who can get their momentum going this way and actually get their force pushing this way are going to be able to accelerate faster and then you become upright, and then you're just trying to spin those wheels. So I, I know it's like a long-winded answer for it, but essentially when you guys accelerate, it's got to be some effort in that. You got to try to get horizontal. And then once you get going, it's just about honestly being quick with your legs and 
there's a lot of stuff like it's pretty intricate to get into what a sprinting motion should look like without showing it so i don't want to get too heavily into it but like learning how your legs should move and what a cycle should look like is really important um and then don't forget the arms because your arms are really important if you're sprinting correctly like, my shoulders get sore when i sprint because like, i'm pumping my arms and if you guys ever try this like my, my younger guys if you guys go out even in your house and you sprint from like wall to wall and if you do that with really short, quick arms, your legs are almost always going to be really short and quick too, which is not good for sprinting, right? We want quick, but we don't want short. So if you guys actually work on getting long arms, get your arms moving with bent elbows, you're going to find that your legs automatically get bigger and produce more force and have speed. So the arms are really important in that too, often neglected. Right. No, I think that I think that's awesome. And I and I really think that that's how we can kind of connect with a lot of these guys with that is, is making sure the arms are synced up with the lower half. I think that's huge. A lot of guys, you know, I see a lot of guys run with their arms side to side like this. I see a lot of guys not really use their arms that much when they run, but they do. They do definitely play a factor and they definitely help for sure. Um, let's get into a little bit of quickness stuff, because I know this is the stuff that's easy. You're able to easily do quickness work and cone drills and ladder stuff um, in a small amount of space. So for me, for instance, and just so you guys kind of know, I was never really the fastest guy in a straight line. So I was never, I was never from home to first really fast. I was never really that quick in a 60 yard dash, but I played shortstop in college. And the reason why is because my lateral quickness was pretty good. I was able to get a really good first step and I was able to get to balls faster. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into that too, but I was able to, I was able to move left and right a lot better than I was able to move in a straight line. And so I noticed with myself, anytime I did any banded sprint work or anytime I did anything like that, it was a little bit more of a struggle for me, but anytime I did any cone drills, any type of cone work where I was going one way to another way, I was cutting back and forth. I actually did, a, I, I was a lot better at that stuff. So Sam, what are the kind of cone drills um, that you recommend? Uh, what kind of stuff do you think these guys should be doing? I know you and I have talked a lot about changing direction and how that can be really, really beneficial for these guys. But with them at home right now, can they take a couple baseballs and line them up in a zigzag or a triangle or, or what can they do at home right now to, to work on their lateral speed and lateral strength if they don't have a ton of space? So the first thing I think I see, especially with my younger guys. So I, you know, we train athletes from high school, college, and then I have, I have guys in middle school and I have even guys, you know, potentially in the late elementary school. So what I usually see with younger guys is they have no, no ability to change direction because they're just not strong enough. So like if you look at a base of strength and you don't need to be absolutely jacked, but to change direction, you actually have to be kind of strong. So if I'm sprinting to my right as hard as I can, my right leg that has to be able to jab into the ground, accept all the force that I'm bringing that way and then push it back that way rapidly. That's a lot of force. So if you just look at that, like for me, what I find youth athletes especially more so than probably anybody else if you just work on your base of strength you know being able to do squats with good technique being able to do lunges with good technique being able to do a plank and actually hold it side planks and being able to hold it you're going to find that you're going to be able to change directions a lot easier because you can actually stop the force so almost always what i see is a guy goes to the right and then when he tries to stop here his body basically goes like this and then it just keeps going a little bit because he can't stop it and then he goes back so you'll see like an extra, you know, second or two that it takes for that guy to actually change directions just because he can't push in the ground, can't basically create any type of tension throughout his body to turn. So that's step one. Step one, like that, the easiest thing you guys can do, is like that low hanging fruit, that thing that's just right there, it's an easy thing to work on, is just developing that basic strength. If you work on that basic strength, again, not anything crazy, just be able to do 10 lunges on each side without shaking. You know, and it will hold a lunge for a minute without shaking on one side. And if you guys can do that, you're going to find that it's a lot easier to change direction just because you're stable enough. And same thing with the core. The core needs to be strong enough. Otherwise, you're just going to have this, like, lag behind, like, a video game where the legs stop but the upper body keeps going because you have no tension. So, you know, athletics, like, being able to change direction, you have to be able to be really relaxed and then create tension and twist and then become relaxed again. So it's got to be that quick motion. Now, as far as drills to just train agility, um, I know ladder drills, we kind of talked about a little bit. I've talked about it with a lot of my athletes here, and I've had discussions with, uh, you know, some parents about it and coaches. I'm not a huge fan of ladder drills. You know, for our youth athletes, if you – like, if you guys – even my older guys, if you've not really done them, I think they're fine. Like, if you've never done a ladder drill and never mastered that, you should go for it. Learn how to move your body in a lot of different ways. But what you're usually going to see is after a few weeks, almost everybody just masters them. 
So like, if you watch me do a, an agility ladder, I can literally crush it without any thought. But if you put me on a field right now, I'm probably slower than some of my athletes because I, I just don't work on that quick change of direction. Yeah. Like never with, you know, sport, you're never just going to be moving you know your legs side to side in a straight fashion. It's, just, it's not necessarily the motion. You know what, the um, one. But it helps for guys who've never done it and never had that type of mastery. It helps. You just learn how to move your body again differently. Outside of that, you guys are better off doing things like shuttles or you know, even skater jumps where you're basically just learning how to do the change of direction. So if I hop to my left side, can I then immediately jump back to my right? And even though you're not actually working on like getting from point A to point B as quick as possible, you're working on how to get out of point A as quick as possible. Because the biggest issue I see is that athletes get into A, they get stuck at A, and they have a hard time getting to B. You know, so if you're really trying to change agility, working on that type of stuff, being able to accept that type of force, and then push it back out is a, is a game changer for a lot of guys. And then outside of that, like shuttle drills work really well. Line up some baseballs. Um, if you want to have some fun with it, you know, you can have a competition with any family member you have. Get like two buckets of balls and even like a hat with you know, five balls in each one of them. And just go from hat to hat or put 10 balls in one and see if you can get all the balls from one hat to the other hat in 20 seconds. You know, it's a good way to work on some agility while, while conditioning a little bit. You can do curved sprints are like a new thing that are kind of cool. So actually occur like running in a circle almost, being able to sprint in a circle, it's a little bit more challenging for your body, but it happens like picture rounding a base, you know, it happens all the time. I was going to um, say that. I was going to say that real quick before you keep going. I think that the circle sprints and the actual change in direction, the upper body, like adapting your upper body will really help in baseball too, guys. So um, like we could do L, like the L drill. So put a cone in an L, start at one side of it and sprint as fast as you can to be able to turn around that cone as quick as you can and change directions. I think that those kinds of things you guys can do. Um, I really like those ones. I didn't even realize kind of honestly sprinting in a circle is big too, because when you hit first base, you got to really change directions as quick as you can to get to go to second base. Um, so I'll, I'll let you keep going, but I was going to, I was going to mention that one. I like that one a lot. Yeah. I think it's a cool thing. And it's honestly, it's becoming pretty popular right now. Like I never really heard about it until last We'll say like six months or so and it's becoming a real thing that people are working on this curve sprinting mark because they're realizing like in baseball for instance how often do you guys hit top speed you know pretty much never like you right. pretty much never reach top speed because if you're a runner let's say you hit a ball you're going to run to first base and if you're running through first base you might hit top speed right about at first base maybe a few feet before that 10 20 feet before it um but most guys like if you hit a double you're going to almost hit top speed and then you're going to curve out and then you're going to curve back and you're going to start running again and you're never going to get quite to top speed. So you still need to be able to reach top speed. It's important that you guys train that quality. If you're an outfielder, you know, you're probably going to hit top speed here and there for a ball. Um, but outside of that, it's really important that you guys work on that ability to be able to change direction and accelerate. Like acceleration is by far, in my opinion, the most important thing. It's why the 60 yard dash probably doesn't make much sense for baseball because acceleration is, is the most useful quality. You have to be able to start and speed up really quickly and be able to just move really quick. If you're a shortstop, you have to be able to take five steps really fast compared to getting to your top speed. Like you're often not going to get to your top speed. So you can even do, you know, different drills where you're literally just going to one, one side, you go into like that skater type landing, you hit the cone and then basically you go right in the field and you ground ball the other way. You know, and you can even, you can, you don't even need a ball. You can do a fake. Like, I know when I played, you know, as a middle infielder, a lot of what we did, it wasn't with a real ball. You know, so if you don't have anybody else, you do the same thing, put your glove on, you go to your left, take a jab, step, go back the other way, and then you just make a fielding play. And it's going to be imaginary, obviously, but you're going through all the same motions, just like you would in a game, just making sure that you're not, you know, half-assing it because you don't have a ball. Right. And I think that that's a big point, too, because I know for a lot of guys that are at home right now, I mean, at least right now, like, if I look outside, it's pouring. So a lot of the guys in Buffalo, like, you're not going to go outside. But guess what? That doesn't mean we don't get our agility ladder stuff in. It doesn't mean – or not ladder work, but it doesn't mean you don't get your agility work in and actually get your body to actually move in different directions. A lot of the guys that are in here, I've worked, you know, privately on Zoom calls and FaceTime sessions, at least for Hot Corner. And, like, they have – if they have enough space to hit, you have enough space to be able to do agility work. And for a lot of you guys, if you want to be able to work quickly and change directions, I mean, this is such a big deal. Like, I know for me, it changed my career. Being able to move laterally was a big deal for me. Being able to change directions is a big deal. And think about it like a football player. Look at running backs. They've got these huge legs. Their, ja their, their, their core and their midsection is, is shredded up, and it's thick and it's strong. 
and watch how they cut in between blockers. I mean, we all watch football, right? So when you watch them cut in between blockers, you're like, man, these guys are able to change directions and move really quickly. Why? Well, baseball, you know, honestly, a lot of times bad hot plays or we anticipate a ball to go in a certain location and it changes or, you know, maybe we have to run one way and then the ball goes a different way or something happens. We've got to change it that way. That applies to baseball more than, you know, so being able to change directions right now is such a big deal. I really like the one that you said about um, like the skater drill where they can hop on one leg and then change directions and go the other way. I really like the hat one where they can, you know, put balls in their hat and then take the ball to one hat and put it in the other one and try and do that for time. The one thing I noticed with sprint work is, is at least with Sam, he talks a lot about time sprints and timed work. And then what you can do guys, like if you're going to do a 10 yard sprint, you guys can actually time it. And then the next week, try and make your times a little bit quick or a little bit faster. And the next week, same exact thing, try and make your times a little bit faster. And I think what that ends up doing is you're going to accelerate a lot quicker because now you're chasing the clock a little bit and then make sure you give yourself obviously that rest. So when I would do my sprint work, my best friend was my, my uh, stopwatch on my phone because I would actually do a sprint. I'd shut it, shut it off. And then I'd restart it for my rest time. So if I was giving myself a minute and a half, I would actually use a timer for it and get myself prepped to go. So you're kind of against the clock there. And I think that that's big too. Cause if you think about a baseball play and this is how all this speed and agility applies, what's the, what's the amount of time that a baseball play happens? I know when I was in college, we always talked about four seconds. Every play happens in four seconds or less. Right. So we want to make sure that we're turning double plays in four seconds. We want to make sure we're fielding a ground ball and throwing a guy out in four seconds. So for sprinting, and like Sam said earlier, really not going to sprint for 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds in baseball. We need to be really good at accelerating and changing directions in, in two to four seconds, pretty much. Right. Same thing with hitting, like hitting and throwing a baseball. It's a very quick movement. And I know a lot of pitchers, they work a lot on mobility and they work, work a lot on agility training. Because for pitchers, it's, it's slow, and then it's boom. It's a really quick movement that happens very fast. So at least, at least I know whenever we were in school, that guy, the pitchers were doing a lot of agility work on top of some of the endurance stuff that they were doing, but we still incorporated sprints into their work. We still incorporated medicine ball stuff because that was the power that helped them kind of stay fresh when they're on the mound. It's a very quick and powerful move. So for a lot of you guys, if I can recap anything that Sam said, I know we have a lot more to go into, but if I can recap anything that he set up to this point, a lot of speed is strength. So you, you're not just going to be able to go outside and run faster. It's not going to happen. You got to be strong, right? So the push-ups and the planks. Um, and Sam, if I can mention one more thing, this whole change of direction thing, right? A lot of guys are going to look at this and say that their legs aren't strong enough. If your core is weak, you're not going to be able to stop your body and move in the other direction because you've got too much crap going this way. So how in the heck are you going to tense that crap up and go back that way? It's not going to happen. So core, leg strength, hip strength, you know, all of that stuff plays a factor as well, guys. So I, I've, and especially in baseball, the hips and the core are super important and it can even be applied even more. If you want to get faster in a sprint speed, look at your core. Is your core strong? Because you're probably going to get faster the stronger your core gets because you're going to be able to brace and you're going to be able to move and your body's going to be able to work a lot more efficiently, right? So I know, Sam, you'll get into some more of that stuff, but um, I just wanted to mention that for sure. Yeah, I mean, the one interesting topic on what you're mentioning, if you guys think about um, when you're in the car and let's say your parents are driving somewhere and all of a sudden something pops out on the road and they have to stop immediately. And you keep flying forward because momentum and maybe that seatbelt jams in you and stops you. That's what's happening to your body. So that's what that's momentum. So basically, you have all the stuff in your midsection. You got organs in there. You got fluid. You got a lot going on, right? So if I'm sprinting to the right, all of that stuff then wants to go to the right. So if my core can't stabilize that and stop that from happening, it's just going to slow you down. You have to be able to stop that momentum to bring it back the other way. Um, and I will say, too, you know, when we talk about sprinting, we talk about a lot of right now, we're talking about tension and getting strong. When you guys sprint, the most important thing that you guys can focus on is being relaxed. Because sprinting, you can't be tense. And I used to be the guy that, you know, I would try to sprint as hard as I can. So I'm clenching my jaw and I'm squeezing my fists and it doesn't work. Your hands should be relaxed. Your face should be relaxed. So I should never look at an athlete sprinting and see like this and, those teeth tensioning and the jaw tight, everything needs to be relaxed because that's when the, what's going to allow you to actually flow and keep moving fast. It's the same thing with hitting or fielding. You know, we talk about it all the time. 
when you hit, you can't squeeze the heck out of the bat. It doesn't work. You have to relax because your body's going to be able to basically, you know, have that quick reflex and create a quick contraction, which is going to be powerful. You know, so we talk a lot about being able to be quick. And one of the most important factors, we talk a lot about muscle, right? We talk about building muscle and getting strong. And one of the things I wish I was exposed to when I was younger, but I wasn't, was something called the stretch shortening cycle. So if you guys go to the doctor and the doctor hits their little wand on right below your kneecap and your, your shin shoots up, right? Your leg kicks up and almost kicks them. That's a reflex that your body has. So when you sprint, when you work on changing direction, you have this reflex where if this is your ankle, when that ankle stretches because it feels the ground, all of a sudden it wants to spring. Boom, it wants to spring. So you guys can actually train that to be better. By doing quick motions, you can train that to be more efficient and basically as soon as it hits, it's gonna boom, push immediately. And that's what's gonna allow you to be powerful. Think about your feeling position. When you guys get into a feeling position, like I know when I used to be taught, it was to get really like just solid on your feet, maybe a little on your toes and just stand there. And what you find is that when you're just standing there, you, you don't have that now quick reflex and you're not going to be able to produce power quick. So you'll find that like if you're doing a lot of these drills, we're talking about agility. Here's another drill you can do. If you stand up and you just have like a parent or somebody, you know, a brother or sister or whatever right in front of you and you just are light on your feet, maybe you're hopping around from foot to foot a little bit. And all they do is throw a ball over your head to the left or the right. And you just have to basically be able to jab one foot in the ground and turn and go. You're going to feel a lot quicker than if you just have your feet planted. And that's because your body has this natural reflex that when it feels stretched really quickly, your body's automatically going to push without you even trying. It's not, you're not even going to think about it. And that's the best thing you can do. Like when you guys throw a ball, you end up getting into this position really quick. And that stretch causes it to sling back out. The same reason why you go to punch, you pull back and then go instead of just pulling back and holding it and then going. You're not as powerful. It's all about the speed of the, of the contraction, right? So you can train that. Be light on your feet. Let that happen. You know, Try to be quick on the ground. Like if you guys are doing your jump work, make sure that you guys are quick. You're not just going down, staying at the bottom and trying to jump up. You're going down and up as quick as possibly can. That's what's going to lead uh, to any type of height. That's going to lead to any of those, you know, adaptations that you're looking for when you talk about getting faster and getting more powerful. Strength only takes you so far. You know, I was a strong guy and I wasn't fast. And I've seen guys come in deadlifting 500 pounds who aren't fast. You know, but the same point, it might help to a point. Right. So yeah. a good drill to work on the uh, stretch shortening cycle that I see there. You, there's so many of them that you can do, but something's as simple as like a jump. But instead of doing it, like, so first off, when you do a normal jump, you do a vertical jump. If you just stand up, go up, and then go down quick, and then quick up, that's gonna work on that reflex. So it can be as simple as just being able to do that. And now if you wanna take it to the next level, what we do with a lot of our athletes, is we'll have them step off of you know, a box that's six to 12 inches off the ground. And as soon as they hit the ground, they have to jump right up. So now we're working on that quickness, right? That stretch shortening cycle, they're not gonna be spending much time on the ground, just gonna hit and go up. And we can do that in a number of different ways. We can do that with skaters where you're going from side to side. That might be called hydens. Um, so we're working on lateral power. You can do it in so many different ways. But for you guys, if you do any of those agility drills and you guys are just light on your feet and let, you know, it just happen, right? You're not thinking about it. You're just trying to turn as quick as possible. That will automatically happen. So the biggest piece to it, if you're trying to Um, it's to do everything quick and make sure that you hit the ground, you're going. When you guys are doing your jumps, you're not staying at the bottom and then jumping. You're going down and up fast. That's what's going to train that reflex. Same thing with sprinting. You know, Make sure you're just going quick and you're not trying to just hit in the ground. It's going to happen naturally. And I think that that helps with getting out of the batter's box too. And I, got, I had a good question sure. that just came in to me. And, and so you, when you guys take a swing, so your body works in one direction, right? And you kind of finish your swing and you're balanced or whatever. And then right away, it's got to be like, boom, I got to change direction. So for me as a left-handed hitter, you know, first base is behind me a little bit. So I've got to hit and then I've got to completely change the direction and turn around and go as fast as I can. And that's basically what Sam is saying. You know, you've got to be able to hit the ground and go. So for a righty, I don't want to say it's easier, but it seems like you're more going in a straight line from, from being a right-handed hitter. Left-handed hitters are naturally faster because they're because they're they're closer to first base, but mm -hmm. you still have to brace the ground and go. So realistically, this this uh, stretch shortening cycle that Sam's talking about 
it really applies to your prep step onto a batted ball right away. Okay. So you guys take a prep step, balls hit, go. And it helps with you make contact with the baseball and then you got or softball and you got to run to first base. You got to brace and get off the ground and get going. So when I see a lot of really fast baseball players, it is because of this because they're able to get their bodies going in a different direction quickly. So it's not necessarily just jumping on one leg and jumping on the other one. It's about how can I hit the ground and go and spring my body forward to actually get down the line faster. Um, I like reaction drills. I like reaction drills a lot. So you said this with, you know, take us, take a couple jogging steps forward. As soon as your mom or dad throws the ball over your head, you hit the ground and go get it. I like that one. If you guys have ever seen those, let me get one really quick. If you've ever seen those crazy ball reaction balls, one of these guys, I really, really like these a lot because they change direction all the time. And so you have to learn to change direction. Otherwise, it's going to make you look silly. I can't tell you how many times this thing made me look like a bad infielder because it just moves all over the place, especially on hard surfaces. So if you're on a gym floor or tile or a hardwood floor, this is a really good thing because it's going to bounce everywhere. It's okay on turf, depending on the kind of turf you have, um, you know, but this is really, really, really good for you guys to work on your reaction, changing direction. So I like that one a lot. And then also like um, reaction sprint work. So, you know, dropping a tennis ball or dropping a lacrosse ball um, from up overhead and hitting the ground and you have to go get it before it bounces and hits the ground a second time. Those are really good reaction drills for you guys to learn how to brace and actually get your body going. So I like those three. Sam, are there any other ones that you really, really like that you can that you can do with these guys to help? I know you do some reaction ball with the guys at the Performance Center, but what are some other stuff that you do? Yeah, so one of them that we do is, is kind of like what you were saying, where you just have a guy do a sprint, but you're going to drop a you know, tennis ball or a lacrosse ball, and they can't let it bounce twice. Right. And we can get a game out of that, you know, especially if we've got a few guys here, we can do a little competition. Uh, my favorite drill with that, though, is to have two lacrosse balls. So I have one in each hand now. You don't know which one I'm going to drop. So you're either sprinting to the left or the right, and then when I do it, you have to be quick. But now, you, now you're not just basically trying to figure out when to go. You're figuring out when to go and where to go. So I like that one a lot. Um, and then going back to, like, fielding drills, if you guys watch the NFL Combine and, and you know, like, all those skills, like the pro – I think it was the Pro Bowl. They had all the, you know, the different skills and stuff. And they had the one drill where the uh, receiver faces away from the quarterback and then has to turn around and figure out where the ball is and catch it. You can do the same thing for like fielding and for uh, you know, quick drills where if I have you face away from me and basically I just yell left or right and you just have to figure out how to get, you know, left, say 10 steps to a cone and back. That's a great way to work on it. And so it's really simple. And then you can add, if you want to add a ball where they have to turn around and you're going to roll a ball one of those directions and you have to go through a fielding play to a forehand or a backhand, you know, so you can do it a lot of different ways, but those are some of my favorites. I think they work really well. I like being able to uh, react not only just like when to go, but the direction of it I like a lot. Yeah, it's good. So you just got to kind of add all those variables into it. I really like um, – I mean, you could do reaction drills for really anything. I know at least for me, I incorporated out for outfield drills. We would do reaction work literally every single day with our outfield, dr outfield guys. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to have some really quick outfielders whenever I was coaching. So it was more of that first step that we were trying to get them to do and changing directions and going different places I think was big trying to get them in, an, in a situation where they felt uncomfortable, I think was really important. Um, you know, so realistically, guys, the one thing I want you guys to really take away from all of this is speed and agility is great, but we have to make it apply to our sport. So when you play other sports like basketball and football, you are going to learn how to cut different ways. That's the reason why we say to play those, because then you can apply that into baseball. Um, I played basketball my whole life, and I learned how to cut and move and change directions and have to play defense and adapt to where the ball's going. So that helped me with my lateral range whenever I played baseball. But the one thing that I never did is I never did track um, and I never did any type of sprint work. So I was actually deficient in sp sprint speed because I never got to full speed in baseball, like Sam was saying before. So that's why I like the idea of other sports. And then the practices with other sports, you got to remember too, in baseball, a lot of times we practice what our skills are going to be. So we practice, you know, moving one way to field a ground ball, throw to first base. You know, we're practicing going back on a fly ball, getting underneath it, you know, making sure that we're behind it to throw through it. But when you go to basketball and football practice, you're going to run suicides and you're going to run gassers and you're going to do cone drills and you're going to do cutting work that you're not going to get in baseball. So, you know, like I said, I think playing other sports and doing other things like that are really important. Um, I don't want to get too in depth into the form of running, but I do like the idea of, of doing like a bunch of different drills. So like 
do you recommend like the side to side shuffle drills for guys? Um, you know, in regards to fielding, I know you and I did the two ball side to side drills the other day at my place. You know, do you recommend those for guys? Like, what are some things we can do position specific that can help guys? Like, what's the difference in the hip movements between an infielder and outfielder, lateral quickness, and how can we separate those kinds of drills? So, yeah, I mean, number one, I do like those drills. I think any type of side shuffle and, and those type of qualities are really important. So if you look at an infielder versus an outfielder, the biggest difference is, uh, and honestly, I'd say not as much as outfielder doesn't need a side shuffle as much. They're pretty much never going to need to do that. Right. But if you look at uh, an infielder, you're obviously working maybe crossover stuff. You're working at side shuffle. I think all those type of drills are really important. And it might be as simple as just having a guy side shuffle, you know, let's say 20, 30 feet. And when they're doing it, you're trying to have them cover as much distance with, with each shuffle as possible. So actually working on power development and speed with it. So that's one way that you can work on it really well. And I think that helps a lot. You actually figure out how to get into your hip and feel it. Uh, and then for outfielders, <clears throat> learning how to turn your hips is really important. And even going like, you know, so with sprinting, so let's say from first to second, you're trying to steal a bag. And for me, like I, I, there's so much conversation. Do you cross over step? Do you drop the foot? Do you do a dead step? Like, what do you do? And I remember I had a kid on my team. Who, this kid would take literally seven steps without moving. Like, he just didn't move whatsoever. And, you know, all the parents would talk about him. No one could figure out what the frig was going on, right? If you look back at it, his issue was he was so upright. So he was producing all that force just straight down and up, which isn't going to move him that way. So he had to learn, basically, he never did, unfortunately, but he had to learn how to get force this way to go that way. So it's basically just learning how to get horizontal. So if you guys think about it, you guys can picture this too. If you're at first base and you're in your steel stance, uh, the first thing that you're going to want to do typically is get weight. Like as soon as you know you're about to go, you're going to take weight off of your right foot. You're going to push with your left foot. Just to, You're going to push. And that push isn't going to be a crazy big push, but it's going to push enough that now you can get your right foot under you a little bit. And now you can drive with your right leg to get going. And that's essentially what you should be doing most of the time when you're trying to steal. Is you basically want to put less weight on your right foot, push with your left, and that's going to give you a good opportunity to get your right foot in a better position to push. It's also going to make you horizontal enough that you can actually sprint. If you're not horizontal, you're not going to be able to accelerate. So that, that's the first piece of it. You know, and it's the same thing I think with infielders. With outfielders, you're just learning how to turn those hips and, and then you got to be fast. You got to be able to produce power very quickly. But learning how to produce that, you know, that hip turn and control it and then find the ball, I think is really important. So any type of drill where you're just doing that is great. Like the one we talked about earlier where you have somebody just throwing a ball over your head, regardless of even if you're trying to catch it. Like they might just be like fetch where you're throwing it over their head and they just have to turn and go. And that type of drill is really effective for that. For infielders, you can do exactly what we said where – you have a guy face you and all you're going to do is throw a ball one way or the other and then you have to adapt to it. Yeah. I, um, and, and I wanted to go into this too. I actually really like this, this part of the conversation. Um, we had a whole day on mobility. How important is mobility and flexibility and in increasing strength in your speed work and lateral movement? So there's prerequisites that, that you need to have to be able to turn properly and be able to produce that lateral force. So for me, when I played, you know, middle infield, I literally got to the point where my, my groin pretty much was so tight that I couldn't move laterally. I was just way too restricted. I, I couldn't actually drive. And basically, if that, that inside of your hip is really tight, it restricts what the outer hip can do. And your outer hip needs to be strong and powerful. So it's really like the worst thing you can do. If you're tight inside hips, it's not going to help you at all. Um, so there's prerequisites. I don't get too much into it. But if you're trying to, like, drive this way, I need to have internal rotation in my one hip. And if I don't have good internal rotation, I'm not going to be able to push. And if I don't have any type of strength from that, obviously I'm not going to get into a good position either. But yeah, mobility is huge. If you're not mobile, like if you got you know, as tight as I was, it's going to absolutely limit you significantly. Yeah. And I think that, that I think that's big. And you know, it's, it's so funny because I, um, I just got a notification on Twitter. And the first thing that popped up on Sports Center is Alex Smith doing cone drills because he's doing footwork stuff. You know, and that's the one thing. Your quarterbacks are really good with footwork stuff. It's kind of really funny how that all works out and how that pops right up. But, like, understand that this stuff is, is trained. And like Sam said, once you stop training it, you're going to start to see a decline pretty quickly too. Um, you know, that decline is going to happen within a week. So, you know, for a lot of you guys, I think a lot of people 
I think a lot of people say, you know, oh, I don't really do sprint work. I just run at practice. Yeah, but, like, we need to actually train that on your own. And then speed and agility stuff, there's absolutely no excuse not to do that stuff right now. I mean, you guys literally have space. And you don't need cones. You don't need all this elaborate stuff that people have at gyms. You can use baseballs. You can use, honestly, like, a sock. You know, for me, a lot of times I would just use a couple wiffle balls and I'd put them in a zigzag or a triangle and I would do some drills that way. Um, you know, so realistically, guys, as we get into the last little bit here, you guys can do this agility stuff at home and it is going to help with your strength too, like Sam said. So for the guys that don't have access to weights and the guys that haven't started lifting, I mean, realistically, and what you guys have heard all week is start with your push-ups and your planks and start with your squats and your pull-ups and your chin-ups and then start into your speed and agility work where you're doing lateral quickness stuff and sprint speeds, that does not require a single weight. What that does, it just gives you guys a base to actually continuously get stronger. And what you're going to notice is the more you guys do that, then once you do get in the weight room, like Sam said, your strength is already going to be there. You know what I mean? You're going to be ahead of the curve because you've already done that, all that baseline stuff. Um, you know, so I wanted to kind of go into that. A lot of people think that sprinting is just like, oh, I'm just not fast. Well, you can actually train it. You know, and for a lot of guys, like, and here's the one thing I want you guys to understand too. This is probably the hardest conversation with the whole thing. If you guys are running a 60 yard dash and let's say you run like a seven, five, which is, which is not going to get, this not going to get it done. Right. You need to get quicker. Understand how difficult it is to knock off a 10th of a second in your sprint. Like it, it gets to a point where it's pretty hard. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, you guys really have to train this. It's, it's just like anything in baseball where, you do all this work and then there's just little benefit, you know, cause we have to kind of climb the ladder a little bit, but when you guys are doing sprint work consistently, understand that your 60 time or whatever your sprint speed time is going to go down by a half of a 10th of a second consistently or a 10th of a second consistently. It's going to take time for you guys to actually develop that. Right. And I, and Sam, I wanted to kind of, is there anything else that you kind of want to go into in regards to this kind of stuff? I know that we don't want to overdo it with a lot of the, the agility stuff, but what are you doing with our guys, you know, and, and what are you having the guys at home do right now that, um, you know, to kind of stay up on it? So, yeah, I'm going to a couple of things. So first things first, every athlete's different again, you know, so I, I have athletes that come in here and they long jump freakishly on day one. And we go to do a trap bar deadlift and they're already, you know, as like a high school freshman or sophomore, they're doing like 250, 300 pounds. So I know that, you know, we obviously it's, it's great to get stronger, but I know that we probably don't need to train his, like, his deadlift that much because he's already strong there. I might have another guy come in, and I had a kid come in, a high school junior, deadlifting over 400 pounds. And right. yet he was the slowest kid I've probably ever had in here. You know, so it's really clear, like, for him, we don't need to work on strength in that aspect. I need to make sure you can produce force quick. So I want you guys to think about this. I don't know if anybody saw this, too. If anybody watched um, Thor – Hat, was, oh, I can't remember his name. It's like Hat for Bjorgsson, something like that. You know, the guy from like oh, the guy that deadlifted like the guy that deadlifted like a thousand pounds. So yeah, I just had 501 kilos, which is ridiculous. It's an incredible amount of weight. And um, when he did it, he literally took I think 10 to 15 minute breaks in between each set. Now, given I, you guys shouldn't be doing that, you guys are not deadlifting over a thousand pounds, and I don't need you to by any stretch of the imagination. But it just shows how important rest is. He would literally do one rep, one single repetition every like 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and then second from that, if you guys watch somebody deadlift, even the, the best deadlifter in the world, when it gets heavy, it's not going to be that fast. It's going to take him a few seconds, four or five seconds to do it. Even a, even a semi-light one is going to take at least a second or two. How quick does sport happen? For me to change directions, that happens in milliseconds, guys. That happens incredibly quick. So lifting is a piece of a yes. That's going to help with how much force you can produce. But if you can't produce the force quickly, it doesn't matter at all. And that's where sprinting comes in. That's why it's so important. That's why training power is so important. So, for instance, if I have a guy who can deadlift heavy weight but can't do it quickly, we're going to work on how quick he can produce power. We're going to do long jump variations. We're going to work on basically overloading how quick he's going to load. So if I'm trying to load my hips, I need to be able to load and unload really fast. And you guys can test with this. You know, when you jump, does it take you a long time to go from going down to going up or going down to going forward? And you're going to find that an athlete who's really powerful, they're going to be able to change directions really fast, even in that type of sense, where an athlete who's a little bit slower, they might actually load. They might sit there for a minute and then jump. And that's fine if you're going to be a power lifter or someone's just lifting massive amounts of weight. But if you're trying to be a really good athlete, it's, it's not going to work. 
you have to be able to load and unload really quick. So the biggest thing when you guys are doing any jumps, you guys are doing any sprint work, whatever it is, just make sure you're loading and unloading really quick. And then the second thing I want to talk about is injury prevention. So when you guys are now upping what you're doing, like a lot of you guys might not have ever lifted before, you might not have ever worked out, you might not have sprinted. How do you make sure you don't get hurt? Number one, strength training is a huge piece of that. So if I'm trying to sprint all the time, I'm putting a ton of force on my knees, I'm putting a ton of force throughout my whole entire body, I need to make sure that my tendons and my ligaments are getting strong enough. And a lot of that's come through, like, through strength training, and a lot of times it's going to be slow. So you might do, like for me, I might do a really slow squat at least once a week. And I, I do do this personally. Where I'll go down, it'll take me three to four seconds to go down. I'm not going to rush on the way up because I'm actually trying to stimulate my tendons. Because when I do my sprint work, I need my tendons to be able to handle that type of force repeatedly. So strength training isn't necessarily only for getting faster, but just to, to be able to deal with the stresses from moving faster even. So you guys just got to keep that in mind. Like a lot of times you guys will see knee issues from guys who are running a lot and doing a lot of sprints and maybe college practice really kicked up a notch. And you'll see dudes with knee issues all the time, tendonitis, the tendon gets inflamed. And a lot of that's because they, they never do anything slow and strengthening the tendons. Everything's always fast. So if there's one thing I can get through to you guys on the course of all of this topic of strength and conditioning is there's going to be some sort of balance. You have to have your fast work. It's really important. It's crucial. You're a baseball player. But you also have to have some slow work mixed in that, you know, we taught, we demonize here on this conversation. We've talked a lot about how you need rest, but there's going to be a lot of times where you don't need rest. If you're training to be able to not get tired and to be able to have an endurance, which is really important, you have to train that quality too. And you don't train them together, right? So if I'm training my body to get faster, I only train it to get faster. If I'm training it to get a better endurance, I'm only training it to get a better endurance and maybe some strength because it can probably handle both. But that's, that's like it, you know? So just make sure that you guys realize there's a, there's a balance between it where everything has to be trained at different times, and it's just a matter of putting that all together. So, like, if you guys are sprinting two to four times a week, throw in two to three days of strength training with that and have one to two days of slow work. You can combine some of that, right? So I might do sprint work before I lift, and then once or twice a week I'm going to do just by itself on an off day. I'm just going to do some slow cardio. Maybe I'm going to do – some agility or not agility but some fielding but i'm going to do a low intensity so i'm just going to work on my technique i'm going to keep my heart rate down maybe i'll play a little catch but it's not super intense so it's just finding that balance between everything where it all comes together so sprint training is not aerobic training but aerobic training is still important and sprint training is still important they just aren't the same they each have to be done separately Right, which is huge to bring in a point, too, because I know a lot of guys – I made this mistake, too, like in the past where I would go for like a couple miles of a run and then I would try and sprint. I didn't know why I wasn't getting faster. Um, you know, so realistically, you know, you got to separate them. I, I really like that. And for you guys, like I, I know that this topic is probably like, oh, okay, I'm just going to go for a run. No, there's a lot more that goes into this. I want you guys to start doing some reaction stuff at home for sure. Um, incorporate that a couple of days a week. Start doing some sprint stuff. I think that's big. Uh, Sam, do you have anything else for these guys in regards to sprint stuff and, and speed and agility? I think we really covered everything. Yeah, not, not so much. The biggest thing I want them to take away is I just want them to sprint and sprint off. And it's the biggest okay. thing you guys can do during quarantine. Awesome. So three, two to four days a week, like we said, start doing some reaction drills at home, get mom and dad involved, tennis ball, wiffle ball, whatever you guys have to start doing some of that stuff. But um, tomorrow, what, Austin, big Q&A day tomorrow? Yeah, Q and A day on everything. So let's um, we'll wrap it up on everything, and um, tomorrow will be kind of like a good wrap up for you guys. Uh, any questions that you have for hitting, pitching, fielding, strength, mental game, whatever it is, bring your questions. I'll have the chat. Um, we'll see how everybody does, but we'll see if we can open it up to everyone. If not, just send it to me. I'll put them in the chat, and we'll do a big Q and A, kind of wrap some things up. I'm expecting email by the end of tonight with just some information regarding the baseball school going on next week. We're going to keep it going. So we will start promoting that. Um, and we will get that information out to everybody who signed up on the list. So uh, great job, guys. This was awesome. And remember, Full Uni Friday, tomorrow, the last one. Let's go. That's um, it. That's it. Bring I'm your getting best. That getting that T-shirt. Hey, let's go. I'm sitting in a straight yeah, to hot to Buffalo. Let's go. I get stuck in that blizzard out there, fellas. Come on. We need some sunshine. <laughs> right. All right, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. You guys. Peace. See you guys. Peace. 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 Peace